Hi, I'm Yvonne Pran from Bible 805, and our lesson today is Romans, Saved by Grace Alone, Challenge to Walk Worthy. Romans is one of the most significant books in the Bible because it is a complete and systematic explanation of the Christian faith. It's different than the other letters of the New Testament that were written to address specific problems in specific churches. The focus of this book, however, was to clarify the Christian faith and our salvation, to show from start to finish that it is by grace alone through faith alone not adherence to Jewish laws or human effort that salvation is possible. At the same time, it clarifies God's continuing expectations for those who've accepted his gift of salvation and challenges them to walk worthy. In this lesson, we'll talk about both parts of the book. Romans has been a life-changing book for individuals and throughout church history. Martin Luther is, of course, one of the best-known individuals and the Reformation. Now, a little bit of history about him. Even as a priest and later a teacher of theology, he struggled with guilt and sin. Then, at one time, he was preparing a lecture on Paul's epistle to the Romans, and he read in it, the just will live by faith. He thought about this statement for some time, and as a result, his biographer said, quote, Finally, he realized the key to spiritual salvation was not to fear God or be enslaved by religious dogma, but to believe that faith alone would bring salvation. This period marked a major change in his life, and it set in motion the entire Reformation. From the, here's what he himself says about it from the introduction of his commentary on Romans, where he says, This letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it, word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the soul. Now, I doubt if many of us will take his advice and memorize it, though that could be a really good idea. But let's look at it more closely. So here are some basic facts about the book of Romans. It was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in Corinth. Now, he wasn't the founder of the church. Most likely, some of the people who had returned to Rome after Pentecost were the actual founders of it. Now, that implies, though, and, and this is really important to keep in mind, that the people who founded the church in Rome were probably very strictly observant Jews, or they wouldn't have taken the time and trouble and money and all that was involved with traveling from Rome to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And much of Paul's letter in the book of Romans clarifies the relationship of the place of faith and grace in the context of Jewish history. The Jewish history, their background was so important, but Paul had to really clarify this for them to really understand what the gospel meant in Jesus. He wanted to fully explain the Christian faith to those who were living in the most important city of that time and who would most likely be responsible for sharing it throughout the empire. To do that, he wanted to go to Rome. But he decided to write them this lengthy letter for sort of getting the first word in, the argument down and in place. Now, he did go to Rome, but it wasn't quite as he planned. He first went to Jerusalem, where he was arrested. The Jews were determined to destroy him and falsely accuse him. Paul is then sent to various regional authorities. The later chapters in Acts tell us about this. And it took over two years of being moved from imprisonment to imprisonment, from jail to jail, from speaking to one person to another, until finally he appeals to Caesar. This was the right of any Roman citizen. And Paul was a Roman citizen. And he was told, to Caesar you will go. The journey was filled with challenges, shipwreck, trials, yet eventually he makes it to Rome, where he will appear before Caesar and will be held in a rented house for two years. 
chained to a Roman guard, and then he'll be released. Now, we don't know the exact history of what happened after that. We know later he was re-arrested, taken to Rome, and eventually martyred there. But an application note on this, we may have a sense of where God is leading us, but the way he does it may not be at all what we expected. In Paul's journey, he wanted to go to Rome. He felt God wanted him there, but he had no idea that arrest, imprisonment for two years on his way, an appeal to Caesar, being shipwrecked, would get him there. And then once he was there, he had no idea he would be imprisoned for another two years. But imagine all who heard the good news about Jesus because of this. Had he gone directly to Rome, only the already converted believers would have heard him. But instead, the leaders of the Jews, Felix, Agrippa, their wives, the entire court, the guards, and all the soldiers along the way heard the gospel. Paul would never have had the opportunity to speak to any of them outside of the opportunities God brought about. And then, Consider the soldiers chained to Paul for two years, 24-7, who might later travel throughout the empire. They would hear him. These soldiers would hear him preaching, arguing, teaching, praying. Literally, they would be standing over his shoulder as the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon were written. What a theological education they would have gotten. His experiences are a living illustration of Romans 8.28, where Paul tells us all things work together for the good of those who love God. Now, our challenge in the application when we're in similar circumstances is this. Remember, Paul continuously challenges Christians to walk worthy and to in everything give thanks, and do everything without griping and complaining. His sufferings would not have had the positive impact they did if Paul hadn't handled them well. It seems that he did. He followed what the Lord instructed him to teach. He had a positive, thankful attitude throughout, and the faith of many grew. When the Lord gives us challenges, it is incredibly important how we handle them, not only for ourselves and our spiritual growth, but for the world watching us. And people do watch Christians. But before all that, before all of those things happened, he had a chance to write the book of Romans. In it, he lays out the Christian faith systematically and completely. A well-known summary of some of the great truths of the faith is found in many places under what's known in organizing the ideas that are in the book of Romans. It's what's known as the Romans Road. And there are a lot of different variations of it. You can look it up online. Now, I'm going to go through a version of it with the various steps. It's usually the Romans Road to Salvation. It has uh, this step, this step, this step, this step. And I'm going to go through a version of it that starts with creation to God's plan of salvation and beyond because the challenge is that in many of these Roman roads presentation or other presentations of the gospel, a real challenge is they stop with salvation. But the book of Romans doesn't. They stop with just accepting Jesus as Savior. And that's super important. It's the most important thing you can do. But Romans doesn't stop there, and neither should we in our Christian lives. The Christian life isn't just about fire insurance from hell. It is an additional journey in what's called sanctification or discipleship. And that once we're saved, we need to actively work on becoming like Jesus. Romans covers all of it. So let's get started. Step one, Romans 1.20. It starts with God who reveals himself. And it tells us, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. People know God exists, and have a sense of what he's like, and they know he's in charge. Knowing that, 
They either decide to get to know him and serve him, or they go their own way. And sadly, most people tend to go their own way. We then go to Ro- to step two, where in Romans 3.23, it talks about how sin turns us away from God. It started with Adam's choice in the Garden of Eden. There was one thing <laughs> that he and Eve weren't supposed to do, but they believed the enemy, Satan, instead of God, because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And because of Adam's sin, we're all born with a propensity to sin. From early on, we want to do what we want to do and not obey or serve anyone. And this verse, Romans 3.23, sums up our situation. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Step 3, Romans 6.23, tells us the end result of sin. Because sin is not without consequences. We'd like to think that it is. I'd like to think I could eat all the chocolate chip cookies in the world and not gain any weight. But it just doesn't work like that. In Romans 6.23, it reminds us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Since God is the source of life, to be cut off from God, is to experience death. In Genesis 3, God said, When you eat of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Die is the Hebrew word ma'uth, to die. But what's important here is that the word is in the imperfect tense, and this is defined as a tense that does not relate so much as to one occasion, but as to a continued condition. Now, the way some translators have put it, and I think this is really accurate, is they say that they they translate it this way, when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dying, you will die. In life and forever, if we're left on our own, it's simply one long death. Beyond God's judgments for evil actions, the results of sin, the continuing death that it talks about includes a meaningless life and then eternal darkness. But that isn't where the story stops. In Romans 4, I mean, in step 4, Romans 5, 8, it talks about how Christ died for our sins. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A penalty had to be paid. And Jesus paid it, not in any way based on us, but on God's incredible love. This is echoed in John 3.16, where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for us. We didn't earn or deserve his dying for us or the reconciliation from God that comes from it by anything we did. This is what makes Christianity unique. Among all religions and all others, humanity must do certain things to be pleasing to God. But the problem is anyone who's honest with himself or herself knows they can't do it themselves. Karma can never be satisfied. In Christianity, Jesus pays the debt we can't pay. Here is what we must do then to receive salvation from Jesus. Step 5. Romans 10, 9, we need to respond and accept the free gift. It tells us if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth you confess and are saved. You need to make both inward and and outward decisions, not mindlessly accepting what you grew up with, not what people around you believe. It needs to be an individual act of faith and commitment. You are giving up the ownership of your life, of going your own way. It isn't simply a goodie to grab and run with, to run away from Jesus with. Once you've got salvation, then I'm going to do my own thing. No, that's not what it's about. You must personally, as they used to say, close with Jesus. Now, on this term, closing with Jesus, the phrase does come from the world of property transactions. And think about it this way. I I really like this um, to explain what it means to accept Jesus as Savior. You can look at a house. You can visit it. You can think it's wonderful. But unless you put your money down, 
unless you commit to the obligations of a purchase, unless you continuously pay them, you haven't closed on the home. And the analogies of our relationship with Jesus are obvious. It is a commitment that should be made only after serious consideration of the truth and reality that our only eternal salvation is possible in Jesus and in full realization of the obligations of it. It means you are no longer in charge. God is, and you must learn his word to understand all that means. Then comes step six, the results of salvation, no condemnation, peace, eternal life. As these verses promise us, Romans 6, 23 again, sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What incredible gifts we've been given. Paul then takes a brief tour in Romans to show that grace has always been God's plan. He talks about his concern for the Jewish people and continues to clarify that salvation by faith in Jesus without works is nothing new. It is the logical and prophetic outcome of their millennia of history. He anchors it with Abraham, who believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Sadly, the people of God entrusted with this truth abused God's grace throughout the Old Testament and then attempted, even after Christ came, they attempted to shut out others who did not observe their incorrect interpretation of the laws. Paul wants to correct all of this. Step by step, he clarifies that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and it's the same for everyone, Jews and Gentiles. Now, to dig a little deeper, there's so much we can talk about, but to keep this lesson at a manageable length, I want to introduce the following key words that explain and expand the meaning of what happens in our salvation. We are, our salvation involves a sacrifice. It involves redemption for us, atonement on the part of Jesus, propitiation, reconciliation, and justification. These are words with extraordinary meanings and applications, and I'm not going to go into all of them now. I have another lesson entitled, Our Salvation Explained, Key Words and Their Meanings, that goes over the meaning of each of these, and it's going to be posted online the same time as this lesson. So please do check it out and learn the meaning of these wonderful gifts that you've been given by God. Now, after this great salvation, how are we supposed to respond? Paul finishes his grand presentation of salvation from first to last when he finishes chapter 11. Now, this might not be clear because the chapter breaks, of course, were not in the original. But we can tell when a major thematic break takes place because of the words and the grammar. Chapter 12 begins with the words, therefore, which is the Greek O-U-V, and it is a conjunction indicating that something follows from another necessarily. In other words, what follows is the necessary result of what came before. God did extraordinary things in bringing about the salvation of all humanity, Jews and Gentiles. We saw that in Romans 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11. And the necessity of what follows is the content of the remainder of the book. God is not asking us to do something without him doing so much more first. This is the process of sanctification, possible because of justification. Justification is a legal term. It takes place in a moment of time when you trust Jesus as Savior. This is where you are positionally, where you stand before God. You are now declared, justified, free from sin in God's sight because you belong to Jesus. Sanctification, on the other hand, is defined as being made holy, set apart for God's purposes, and it is a process. The process of sanctification is only possible 
once you're justified. You can't do it on your own. You can't clean yourself up enough to be acceptable to God. It's only after he saves you and you realize you are acceptable that then you can become the person he wants you to be. Sanctification you live into, you grow into your new position. That's what Romans 12, 16 is all about. We only have time to briefly introduce it, but on your own, study, meditate, and pray through these chapters. They really are life-changing. Let's look at a key passage, Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Often in the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus gave his life for us. Once we accept that we are purchased, paid for, not our own, we then realize that we need to be, in return, a living sacrifice, dead to sin and alive to Christ. Living it out is how we worship. Not simply big emotions on Sunday and then living however you want the rest of the week, but a conscious, continual submitting our will to his will. We need transforming. So how are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind. We must learn to think in new ways because naturally we don't know how. Standards of the world, media, other people are often at odds with what God wants from us. That is why we need to know the Bible, not simply to understand the theological aspects of our faith, but how to walk worthy of the great salvation we've been given. May that always be our prayer as we study. The specifics of what that means we're going to discuss in much more detail in the remaining lessons that we have on the various churches in the New Testament. Let's simply be thankful for the great salvation that we have in Jesus, not dependent on what I do, but solely dependent on what Jesus did for me. Let's pray that all of us might walk worthy of that extraordinary gift.